the land of the Plague Lord. In this universe, all rots. In this universe, one must rot to survive. An excerpt from the enlightenment of Corvid Kalthrax, a harbinger of Carrion. The land of the Plague Lord, often better known as the Garden of Nurgle, is no ordinary garden. Perhaps it is not really a garden at all, but the mortal minds that contemplate the manifested will of the Plague Lord must attempt to make some sort of sense out of what they have seen or heard about in whispered tales. They must place it in some sort of relatable context that they can consider without going insane. The same tomes and other forbidden texts that have attempted to describe the lord of the land himself have, for the most part, agreed that the idea of Nurgle's realm being a perverse, deadly, and yet strangely beautiful garden best puts chaos into terms they can fathom. Like a normal garden, the domain of Nurgle is home to a bewildering array of flora and fauna, all interconnected and supporting the whole. Beds of bright blue shovel petal plants dig themselves up and leave the dirt in which they grew so that plague bearers can plant new skull seeds in the rich loam. As the skull seeds grow and blossom, they attract bounding, stomping, over exuberant beasts of Nurgle that mistake their fruits for the heads of new playthings. This scatters their matter violently into the air, where it comes to rest on the wings of the ubiquitous flies. Slowed by the sticky pulp of the splattered plants, these insects become easy prey for other flying creatures that ingest them as they soar through the rot-choked air. Unbeknownst to the predators, Bloatflies are carriers of many of Nurgle's experimental diseases and other creations. With their innards thus infected, these predators sicken, vomiting the contents of their guts all across the garden as they fly about and eventually explode in showers of life-giving flesh and blood. This bounty of mutated and mutilated tissue falls into new areas of the garden beneath, decaying into compost and starting the cycle of life and death anew. Though the Garden of Nurgle does share certain commonalities with gardens and jungles on planets in real space, it still is not a worldly garden in any sane sense. A visitor in this bizarre and perilous realm doesn't walk from this place to that. They experience what needs to be experienced. Even the demons that tend to the Garden of Nurgle are not really what might be thought of as a workforce to the rise at the place, does a job, and then leaves for other regions. These demons are a part of the experience of the garden itself. This is especially troublesome for the plague bearers, whose metamorphosed minds were once mortal and still strive to impose a modicum of reality in their unreal existences. Still, even the plague bearers accept their place in the garden and spend their eternity enjoying all it offers in their own way. The plague father affords all its children many ways to explore and appreciate its realm, and even to become a part of it. 
Though it is a god of chaos, it also has a need to create order, to monitor its creations, and to control its experiments. A visitor to its realm would find a dizzying amount of diversity of experiences. Here they might find trees made of nothing but the flesh of Eldari, constantly oozing the tears of a dying race. There they might find fields where tongues sprout up from the earth, each one blistered by the malign influence of a different infection. There is no telling what wanders await around each bend in the pass that stretch and wind throughout the Garden of Nurgle, but any who encounter them will surely have their sanity tested and questioned should they survive to share the tale. This land is an ever-changing realm shifting according to the needs and whims of its master. Many areas exist only temporarily, taking shape to allow the play god to indulge a particular fancy, or to be granted to an especially accomplished great unclean one as a reward. Even so, the legends hint that some aspects of this footed domain remain relatively constant. Nurgle has need of fields in which to plant its crops of blighted herbs, pits to hold the bodies upon which it conducts its experiments, and most important of all, a gigantic and decrepit mansion in which to store its creations, brew its legendary contagions, entertain guests, and plot the course of the great corruption. While the mortal realm is laid waste by blight and pestilence, the lands of Nurgle and the realm of chaos thrive on disease and corruption. Tended by the Lord of Decay, this unwholesome realm is home to every pox and affliction imaginable, and is foated with the stench of rot. Twisted, rotten boughs and tangled with grasping vines cover the mouldering ground. Entwining like broken fingers, fungi, both plain and spectacular, break through the squelching mulch of the forest floor, puffing out clouds of choking spores. The stems of half-demonic plants wave off their own accord, unstirred by the insect-choked air. Their colors puncture the gloom, havens of cheeriness in a dismal woodland. Human-featured beetles flit along the banks of sluggish, muddy rivers. Reeds rattle whispering the names of the poxes inflicted upon the worlds of mortals by Great Nurgle, or lamenting those that have died from the caress of their creator. Jutting from amidst this primordial mire is Nurgle's man's. Decrepit and ancient, yet eternally strong at its foundations, the mansion is an eclectic structure of rotted timbers and broken walls, overgrown with crawling poison ivy and thick mosses. Cracked windows and crumbling stone compete with verdigris coated bronze, rusted ironwork, and lesion covered cornices to outdo each other with their corrupted charm. Within these tumbling walls, Nurgle toils. Beneath mildewed and sacking beams, the great god works for eternity at a rusted cauldron. A receptacle vast enough to contain all the oceans of all the worlds. Chuckling and murmuring to itself, Nurgle labors to create contagion and pestilence, 
the most sublime and unfettered forms of life. With every stir of Nurgle's maggot-ridden ladle, a dozen fresh diseases flourish and are scattered through the stars. From time to time, it reaches down with a clawed hand to scoop a portion of the ghastly mixture into its cavernous mouth, tasting the fruits of its labor. With each passing day, it comes closer to brewing its perfect disease, a spiritual plague that will spread across the extent of the universe and see all living things gathered unto its rotting embrace. Dwarfed by their mighty lord, a host of plague bearers are gathered about it, each chant sonorously, keeping count of the diseases created the mischievous nurglings that have hatched, and the souls claimed by the Lord of Decay's putrid blessings. This hum drowns out the creaking of the rotten floor and the scrape of the ladle on the cauldron, so eternal in its monotony that to hear it is to invite madness. When its diseases wax strong in the mortal realm, its garden blooms with death's heads and fresh filth, encroaching upon the lands of the other Chaos Gods. War follows as Nurgle's adversaries fight back, and the plague bearers take up arms to defend the morbid forest. From such war springs more of the richness of life and death, of triumph over adversity. Though Nurgle's realm will eventually recede again, it will have fed deeply on the fallen and will lie in gestate peace until it is ready to swell throughout time and space once more. The Mansion of the Plague Lord There is a house of decay at the center of Nurgle's garden. Its racked and twisted structure creaks and groans under the influence of baleful, toxic winds. Shutters cling just barely to window frames, only half filled with broken panes of filth-covered glass. Sewage drains spill forth beetles, maggots, and twisted centipedes with only tongues for their bodies and human fingers for legs. Paint continually cracks and peels away from the wood beneath, yet the house never loses its grey-green hue. Along the roof, Hundreds of chimneys bellow out dark clouds that, upon close inspection, are composed of millions of floating, buzzing flies. All around this house, trees made of bone bear fruit that rots even as it swells. The leafless boughs of these ancient trees provide shelter for demonic birds that sing the funeral dirges of any unwelcome visitor. It is a house of pestilence, rot, and death. This is Nurgle's Mansion, also called the Mansion of the Plague Lord. And that means that it is also a place of hope and renewal. There can be no explanation for the strength that keeps this structure from collapse, save that it is the dwelling place of the Lord of All, whose boundless energy, sense of eternal purpose, and limitless joy for its work finds perfect peace with the inevitability of decay. Nurgle itself often sits in a massive chair just to the side of the mansion's front door. From there, it entreats visitors, both summoned and unexpected, to approach, share tales and questionable libations, and explore the countless rooms within. Inside the vast structure, a guest could easily become lost. 
rotten floorboards send many to a doom of slow consumption by the carrion feeders that dwell in the lower levels. Grand staircases decorated with moth-eaten rugs beckon to wandering souls, leading them to chambers where demons are glad to receive new, fresh flesh. Should the guest bypass these rooms and continue upward, they might find their way to the attic, where Nurgle keeps samples of its multitudinous works of decay, catalogued and countered over and over again by attendant plague bearers. This attic are jars containing the viscera of plague victims from across time and space. Souls are trapped within apparently simple glass containers, left to slowly dim and fade as maladies of the spirit waste them to the bone. If the visitor walked past the stairs and pushed deeper into the mansion, they might stumble upon the kitchens and larders of the Plague Lord's home. Every foul ingredient, every pestilent component imaginable, and some that defy sanity rest on shelves here, neatly labelled and ready to be combined in the great cauldron. A wise guest moves on quickly from here, knowing that to linger is to become flavouring for the noxious stew, for this cauldron is among Nurgle's prized possessions, and it likes to keep it full. It is in this great black crucible that the Lord of All brews the many plagues it pours into the mortal realm. Nurgle is a creative being, and it will take inspiration for experimentation where it finds it. Seldom can it resist the temptation to add nearby visitors to its virulent concoctions. The vibrant grounds of a morbid estate. Nurgle is, unlike the other ruiner's powers in many ways, including how it views its domain within the realm of chaos. Corn, for instance, rarely leaves its throne, barking orders to its generals from atop a mound of skulls. Slanesh watches the happenings of its kingdom from within its palace of pleasure, or wanders the universe, seeking to tempt mortals into giving up their souls to satisfy its hunger. Zinj seems to not care much at all for the state of its warped and fractured lands, spending its time plotting and interfering with affairs in realms beyond its own. Now Nurgle, on the other hand, cherishes the beauty and surprises of its garden. It routinely takes strolls down its twisted paths, cavorting with its demons and stopping to observe as one of its diseases takes its toll on a wounded captive. Nurgle is in touch with its land and its many regions. In its wanderings outside of the mansion, it passes by some of its favourite places, many of which have existed since Nurgle first thought of them and are likely to be the models for the reborn universe that is to come. A moment's journey from the mansion are the deathbeds, a place it visits more often than perhaps any other. It is a place that serves two purposes. Not only are wayward travellers and defeated invaders trapped here, stored in the deep pits and sucking muck of this place, awaiting some future foul use or their eventual demise, but it is here that Nurgle can indulge in one of its greatest forms of entertainment. The Plague Lord loves to hear stories of the realms beyond its own, they inspire it to create new pestilences that are well suited to other lands, 
and in the deathbeds, it has countless potential storytellers. Sometimes it offers these unfortunates the chance to improve their position by spitting the worms from their mouse and sharing tales of their worlds with it. Those who amuse it sufficiently are plucked from the muck and removed to the mansion. There they have the great honor of becoming vessels for Nurgle's newest plagues. Once they are properly infected, Grandfather Nurgle smiles, giving them one last tender, gut-churning embrace and send them back into the lands their stories described. After visiting the deathbeds, Nurgle often makes the Poxyards the next stop on its stroll. It is here that it tests the efficiency of its contagions of the flesh and spirit. Each malady requires a different set of trials to gauge its ability to achieve the Plague Lord's desires. This means that the physical form of the Poxyards changes to suit the task. For a test of the spirit, this region of the garden may be filled with crystal clear lakes. A dehydrated test subject may see these lakes and, believing salvation is at hand, drink deeply of the cool waters. Suddenly, the water will turn to pus, tormenting the sick and weakened soul. For a test of a skin-eating disease, the poxyards may be filled with claw-thrust brambles. Infected captives can be sent running into the demon plants, chased by beasts of Nurgle. If the captives scream as they pass through the razor-edge branches of the plants, then Nurgle knows that the poor wretches can still feel pain and its affliction needs refinement. No matter the incarnation of the Poxyard, this corner of the garden always gives Nurgle new insights, and therefore it spends a great deal of time there. There are other places such as these, places that are always buzzing with activity and joy. The Morabusium, where the most precious and toxic herbs take root. The Dunglash Arboretum, where refined excrement hangs from trees like putrid, reeking vines and many others. All of these regions provide Nurgle with the ingredients and insights it needs to further its work at the cauldron when it returns to the mansion after one of its invigorating jaunts. The Realm of a Million and One Plagues In addition to the mainstay regions of the land of the Plague Lord, there are many others that enjoy a less permanent existence, coming and going with the ascendancy and passing of one of Nurgle's many plagues. Some of these likely only exist in the nightmare visions and untrustworthy hallucinations of disease-ravaged minds. Still, the Garden of Nurgle is near infinite, and it is not so unbelievable that a recipient of one of its great gifts might be blessed with a fleeting glimpse of the Plague Lord's realm. With their last dying breaths, some mortals gasp and choke out words, saying that they hear faint bells tolling. Perhaps they refer to the blossoms that grow in the death bell lily fields. When a mortal dies as a result of one of Nurgle's many diseases, one of these pallid flowers opens up and emits a tiny chime to mark the success of Nurgle's handiwork. The ringing is incessant. The hanging gardens of Tush Bolg are a sight to be seen. This remote slice of Nurgle's realm was given to the great unclean one 
Tosh Bulg as acknowledgement of its use of choking plague to wipe out an orc infestation on Hurax, a planet that Nurgle coveted. To commemorate its victory and to demonstrate constant thanks to its lord for its reward, Tosh Bulg used its own intestines to hang every single orc from the colony in the trees of its domain. There, they dangle and rot, slowly dying, but never quite finding release. Plague bells toss organs from the bodies of diseased victims into sorting pools, making it easier for them to count the numbers that have died from each ailment. Beasts of Nurgle frolic in fields where planted spines yield crops of dementia-inducing foodstuffs. Nurglings cackle with glee as they roll down hillsides that form spontaneously when great unclean ones vomit up regimens they consumed thousands of standard years ago. The land of the Plague Lord is a wondrous place filled with vitality, mirth, and experiences beyond mortal comprehension. It is a playground for the minions of the Lord of Decay, a laboratory for its work, and a comforting home for a god that knows its realm is the shape of things to come. The Caged Maiden the Eldari believe that when Slanesh, the Lord of Pleasure, awoke in the early 30th millennium, their gods were destroyed outright. Yet there is one myth upon a single craft world that tells of how the maiden goddess, Isha, was not slain by the Dark Prince and absorbed by it like the rest of the Eldari pantheon after its birth during the fall. Slanesh vanquished her as he had all of the other Eldari gods within the warp, but only took her prisoner rather than absorbing her energies outright. What foul purpose it had in keeping Isha alive None amongst the Eldari now know, but the Prince of Pleasure was ultimately denied its spoils. For some reason, Nurgle, the Plague Lord, waged war against Slanesh to rescue the Eldari Goddess. Why Grandfather Nurgle intervened is unclear. Although some Eldari scholars believe that one of the oldest of the major chaos gods wanted to give the youngest amongst them a good lesson about its proper place in the order of things. What is known is that Nurgle's demonic forces proved victorious and it took the Eldari goddess back to its domain in the realm of chaos. A goddess of fertility and rejuvenation, and a god of decay, seemed an odd pairing. But Nurgle came to adore its new companion like no other being in the universe. And yet, the adoration of a chaos god is a strange thing, for Nurgle shows its affection in cruel ways. It keeps her imprisoned in a rusted cage in the corner of its cauldron chamber within its personal mass. It is there that it keeps the cauldron where it mixes the elements that create all of its plagues and pestilences. When the plague god creates a particularly pleasing brew, it forces Isha to imbibe the putrid mixture, watching with building excitement for the symptoms of its latest contagion. Though as the goddess of healing, Isha can cure herself of the disease's ravages, the speed with which she is free from its grip allows the Plague Lord to evaluate its creation's virulence. If Nurgle is pleased, 
It returns to its cauldron and empties its contents into a bottomless drain, the noxious liquid falling as rain upon one of the mortal worlds. If the concoction does not meet with its approval, it gulps down the contents of the cauldron, vomits it back into the pots, and starts afresh. While the Plague Lord is busy at its cauldron, Isha accepts her lot stoically, and fights back against the Lord of Decay's evil in the same way she once fought against Cain, whispering the cures to these new diseases into the universe so that mortals might know them and resist the hideous designs of Grandfather Nurgle. Uninvited Guests Very few mortal eyes have beheld the land of the Plague Lord. Its swamplands constantly wheeze a fog of supernatural diseases, and living beings cannot endure so much as a single breath of its repugnance. Only Nurgle itself can spare visitors from its garden's toxic affections. When it is expecting company, it will open a path through the gurgling fungus fronds with a single magnanimous gesture. Trespassers are viewed poorly in Nurgle's domain, as the seers of Luganath found to their cost. The Eldari of that far-flung craft world have long told the story of the Caged Maiden, wherein Isha, the goddess of fertility and healing, is imprisoned in Nurgle's mansion at the mercy of her grotesque admirer. These Asuriani believe their legends to be absolute truth, and even aspire to one day free their goddess from Nurgle's unctuous grasp. So it was that when Luganath was ravaged by the brittle coma, an army of its most gifted psychers cast their minds into the realm of Nurgle in pursuit of the truth of the myth of Isha's captivity, hoping to find their lost goddess and put a halt to their craft world's deadly malaise with her freedom. They knew that they would almost certainly die in the attempt, but believed that their souls would ultimately be drawn back into the glittering spirit stones of their comatose bodies. Once safe in their crystal afterlife, they could impart Isha's message to the spirit seers and lift Nurgle's curse from their homes. At first, their astrally projected forms appeared to be able to pass through the grasping foliage of Nurgle's garden with ease. Their ghost helms kept them as insubstantial as spirits, and their rune-shielded minds cut through the dismal vegetation, for they were sharper than any corporeal blade. The rot flies of that realm buzzed loud in alarm, however, and whispered of the intruders into Nurgle's ear. Just as the seers of Luganath sighted Grandfather Nurgle's mans in the distance, a great host of plague bearers rose up from the mud and began to chant in a droning monotone as they came forward. The seers channel their psychic energy into great blasts of cleansing blue fire, boiling away huge chunks of Nurgle's army and darting out of the clumsy reach of their foes. But ever more plague bearers emerge from the slurry to block their path. The battle raged for solar days, and swaths of Nurgle's garden were blasted to ruin in the process. However, in the material dimension, the physical form of the trespassing seers began to convulse and shake, succumbing to the very plague they hoped to overcome. 
slowly as their bodies shriveled and their spirit stones turned to rotting mulch. The souls of the seers that were trapped in Nurgle's realm began to pass fully into the immaterium. The soupy air of the garden seeped into their lungs, worm-riddled mud spattered up their legs, and white-bodied demon flies clamored into their mouths. Claimed at last, the seers' feet took root as their faces hardened into bark. Their arms split and twisted into gnarled branches, each finger hung with ripening, nurgling fruit. The seers of Luganath remained there still. A copse of wailing trees that brighten Nurgle's leisurely walks and strike a note of despair into the heart of Isha, its immortal captive. Such is the fate of those who enter uninvited into the land of the Plague Lord, for even the generosity of the Grandfather of Plagues has its limit.